Hello, everyone. Trevor May, VRF inductory split technical specialist, back again with our tech tips mini series. And on this specific focus, a part of our tech tip mini series, we're going to be focusing on the basics of troubleshooting a ductless split system. Uh, this is going to be broken down into individual error codes and things to look for. Uh, and first and foremost, we're going to go ahead and start off with just the bare bones basics or an entry guide into starting to troubleshoot uh, basic things on a ductless split system and definitely things to be aware of and to keep an eye out for as you start troubleshooting a single zone or a multi-zone ductless split. So the first thing we definitely want to cover on here is something that often gets overlooked, uh, which would be your wireless controller. And oftentimes, typically the batteries over time, they tend to weaken or they don't send a strong enough infrared signal, which you can see here. Uh, in the top part of that wireless controller is what actually sends that infrared signal to the indoor unit to send a command and in the follow me mode also receives an infrared receiver signal back to the wireless control so that it can report talk back and forth between that wireless controller so that it can read room temperature from the wireless remote controller. So if you do have a wireless controller that you suspect that may be faulty, instead of taking a guess at it, the first thing that you should do when you're dealing with these, regardless of whether the system is brand new or not, is make sure that you have a nice fresh set of batteries in there. Uh, there are a lot of circumstances where guys are thinking way too advanced with this and overlook the basics of maybe the batteries are starting to weaken and I should work with a fresh set just so I know that I could take that out of the equation and that's not a factor into why that this system is not responding to a command signal from the wireless remote controller. So of course you wanna start by replacing your batteries first, starting with a fresh set. Now, in order to troubleshoot whether you have an issue with your wireless handheld remote controller or an infrared receiver board on a high wall, cassette, ducted or floor console unit, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna pull out your camera. Now your camera is going to depend on what type of operating system you have whether you have an Android style system or you have an iOS operating system. So with the Android style system, you can use either your forward facing camera or your rear facing camera, or I always call it the selfie mode where it's a forward facing, like you would take a selfie. Android does not have an IR blocker on their forward facing camera or their front facing camera or the selfie style camera function. On the iPhone or the iOS operating system, on the traditional camera, the forward facing camera, they actually have an infrared receiver blocker. So using this, this method to troubleshoot, is it going to work? So you must use the forward facing feature on your iPhone or iOS operating system so that you can see this flash that we're about to demonstrate for you to troubleshoot whether the wireless controller is the issue or the infrared receiver board may be the issue. So you wanna take your wireless controller out alongside with your phone. Now, again, if you have the Android, you could just use the, use the forward facing camera and put that wireless controller directly in front of it and focus right on that infrared receiver beam right at the top, the little clear part, okay? Now, if you have an iPhone, you wanna put it on the forward face or the, uh, the selfie mode, the rear facing mode and do the same exact thing. You wanna focus it right on the top of that infrared receiver, right on top of that controller where that signal is sent out. Now, once you focus it on there, what you're going to do is press the on and off button. And what you're looking for is a little purple flash. Okay, we're going to demonstrate that too. Okay, you see that little purple flash on there? That's that infrared receiver signal. That's the actual infrared beam, if you want to call it such, that's going to be sent to that receiver board with a command for heat, cooling, fan speed settings, timer functions, or to simply turn the system on or off. Now, if you start with a fresh set of batteries and you go to do this and you do not see that flash, then you know that wireless controller is not sending the infrared receiver signal to the indoor unit, namely being the display board. And now you can rule out that that infrared receiver is not an issue and it is in fact the wireless control because you do not see that purple flash. Okay. If you do see that purple flash and the unit still isn't responding, then you can focus your attention away from that wireless remote controller and now start looking at the infrared receiver panel 
and also looking at a main control board issue or a connection issue. Typically, what we see with that is the 10 pin plug, which supplies voltage to that display board to power it, usually gets left unplugged or something becomes loose or something gets kinked in the wire where it's not able to actually properly power it. There have been the rare circumstances that the infrared display boards have failed, but it's very far and few in between. Typically, it's associated with an actual connection from the main board to the display board. But this is a really nice tool and also good to understand, especially when you get into a situation where you need to narrow down, hey, do I have an issue with a wireless controller? Do I have an, infrared, uh, an issue with the infrared receiver? Or do I have an issue with from my main board? And with this process and something that we carry in our pockets, we can essentially narrow down you know, where the issue is going to be, whether that's a wireless controller, infrared receiver board, or main PC board, or of course, a wiring issue as well. So let's get into the different types of units outside of the high wall style units, which we're all familiar with, with the digital display on there that spits out some form of letter and number error code to tell you what kind of code is coming up on the system. So if you have a cassette style indoor unit, you'll see on there the actual fascia or the beauty plate of that cassette is in the space itself. And on the bottom side, you will see a little black panel that has a few sets, few sets of buttons on them. First button is going to be, or I should say light, is going to be your operation lamp. So of course, this is going to be illuminated when the power is turned on to the system. The second lamp on there is going to be your timer indicator if you have the timer function set up on this indoor unit. The one in the middle on there is going to be a digital LED. Now, depending on the tonnage of uh, indoor unit that you're working with for the cassette is going to determine whether you actually have an LED display on the cassette. The nines, the 12s, and the 18s do not have that digital display. Typically, this is on the larger tonnage compact cassette style units. Now, when I say compact, I mean a two by two cassette, which is the only size cassette available in the ducted or the uh, ductless product line. Your next light on there is going to be your defrost and fan light. Now, obviously, the first part of this is pretty self-explanatory. If the unit's in a defrost mode, this is going to be illuminated. One other thing that technicians and also homeowners ask the technicians is going to be, hey, the unit's not in a defrost, but I see this red light illuminated when I turn the unit on for heat. Why is it illuminated? Because it's not in a defrost. So the other half of that, the fan half of that, actually indicates that the fan is locked out in the heating mode because we are in what we call the anti-cold air function. Now, with this anti-cold air function, it's active on every ductless indoor unit. And the whole purpose behind it is, as soon as we have a call for heating, especially when the system's been off for a while or the indoor coils aren't quite up to temperature, if we would kick on that fan, we would essentially have some cool air that would be blown on the customer and it would make an uncomfortable situation for them, of course, depending on where that unit is in proximity to where they are in the room. So what we do is, is we leave that fan off in the heating mode. We start the system up and allow that hot gas to circulate in that indoor coil. And there's a T2 temperature sensor in there, which is on one of the passes or U-bends of the indoor coil. That sensor is looking at a certain temperature before it engages the fan in low, medium, and then finally either high or whatever setting speed that you have that wireless controller set at for your indoor fan speed. That light will stay illuminated until you reach that maximum setting of high speed or whatever the setting fan speed is. So if we were to look at it as a generic example, now these temperatures aren't accurate. This is just for an example. Let's just say at 95 degree coil temperature that we will initiate low speed. What you'll see with that defrost fan light, it'll still be illuminated even when that fan starts up in the low speed. Let's say 100 degrees initiates mid speed on there. Light's still going to be illuminated. And then finally, once we've reached, let's just say 110 degrees, this control function or the anti cold air function releases. That defrost fan light does not light up anymore. The louvers open up, and now the fan speed is either in high or whatever setting fan speed. The other way to tell outside of not having this light lit up is that you can actually make changes to the fan motor speed and it responds. If you're in this anti-cold air function, it locks the fan speed options out for the time being until it reaches a certain coil temperature because 
we have the fan locked out. We want to make sure we have a nice warm coil to be able to provide warm air when the customer is calling for heat. So it's definitely something to be aware of as a technician and also great knowledge to have to be able to pass along to the homeowner because it's, I'm sure at some point in time, they're probably going to notice it or at least come across it. Finally, your alarm light on there. If you do have an alarm active on the system, this lamp will illuminate. And if you have a digital LED, it will uh, give you your error code, just like you were used to having with the digital display. If not, typically there's a flashing sequence between the operation and timer indicators. And if you look in the service manual, depending on how many times they're flashing back and forth, will indicate a particular code. And finally, you have your little square uh, black box in the end, which essentially is just the infrared signal receiver, which receives the commands and makes it compatible with a wireless remote controller. Okay. Now with the cassette styles, when you actually have the body of the cassette mounted up in the ceiling and you go to put the fascia or the uh, beauty cover on the uh, cassette itself, the actual body of the cassette, you're going to have a few different connections on there. Your first connection you need to plug in on the main board is your 10 pin connection. That is to enable your grill display or to power that little display that we just discussed a slide ago. You also need to make sure that you plug in your five pin port connection to the grill louver motor port on the main board. If not, your louver motors will not operate. And then finally, if you have a older style, so this would be a KSACN0101 wired remote controller, there is a five wire plug for a wired wall controller to plug in. If you do not have that model number thermostat, or should I say wired controller, or if you're not utilizing a wired controller and using the wireless option, you can tuck this away nice and neat. It does not need to be plugged into anything. The newer style wired controllers, which would be the KSACN 0401s, which are compatible with these compact set style units, have a four wire plug. So if you have that style thermostat or wired controller, you'll notice on there that that four pin doesn't plug into this five pin. And that's usually another question that we get. There is a separate terminal on this board, which is labeled CN40, which is a four wire connection. And right above it, it usually is printed wired controller. That is where the new style thermostats or wired controllers get plugged in on the main PC board and not to this optional harness that comes with the actual fascia or beauty cover of this cassette style indoor unit. Now moving on to our ducted unit, the ducted unit does come with its own infrared receiver. However, it comes in the accessory bag and it is not plugged into the main board. The issue becomes is that if you're looking to read out an error code from this indoor unit and this is not plugged into the board, there's no way to actually get a nice readout of that error code other than going to your outdoor unit to see if an error code is active out there. So a good rule of thumb is in the accessory bag, don't just discard everything in it. Make sure that you plug this into the 10 pin connection, just like we've seen on the cassette style unit here, where the 10 pin connection, except now it's going to get put in to the board at the ducted unit. Okay, so that gets plugged in, it'll power up, You'll see here you have two little black slots. The one furthest to the right is your digital screen, which actually has a readout of your set temperature. And if there is an active error code, we'll display that active error code. The one right here, right to the left of that is your infrared receiver panel, where that signal from a wireless controller can be sent to change the set point, the fan speed, the mode, starting timer function, um, and a bunch of other things. You can also access your advanced service menu by using that wireless controller as well. But you'll see on here, just like with the cassette style unit, you have your operation, your timer, your alarm, and then that defrost and fan light. Remember with that defrost and fan light, not only does that mean defrost, but if it's illuminated and you're not in a defrost, that means you are in an anti-cold air function where the fan is locked out until that indoor coil temperature reaches a certain degree during a heating call. Okay. Other biggest thing on there, you'll notice there's a manual button. If you press that manual button, what essentially what that is, is a forced auto, a forced cooling, and then you also have an option to force defrost. And I just want to back up one slide here, two slides actually. The temporary button, which you can see in this depiction, is the same thing as the manual button on the cassette to force it into an auto mode, to force it in a cooling mode, and also to force defrost. So that option is available on every 
ductless style indoor unit, whether it is a cassette, a ducted, a floor console, or a high wall style unit. Now, when you press this button once, you'll hear an audible beep. If you have this infrared receiver plugged in, you will see a 76 display on the screen, which is a fixed set point of 76. The first push on it puts it in an auto mode. So it'll either toggle between heating or cooling based on the return air thermistor with a fixed set point of 76 degrees. If you press the button again, you will see an FC displayed on that screen. That FC indicates a forced cooling function. That is a fixed set point of 76 degrees. Both the auto mode and the forced cooling mode have a fixed runtime of 30 minutes. Essentially, what this is meant to do is that if you have a temperature sensor, whether it be return air or indoor coil temperature sensor that is coding out on there, you can use this button to bypass that for a 30 minute time period to be able to run the system to make sure and check your delta T, not only to make sure the charge is correct, but that you're getting a good supply air temperature, of course, depending on what mode you're uh, running the system in. Okay. And then finally, to force defrost, what you're going to do is press that button twice to see the FC display on it, and then press and hold that button until you see a lowercase d and uppercase f, which indicates you have now forced a defrost. The system will go into a defrost mode, and now it will look at the outdoor coil temperature and compressor runtime to be able to not only start the defrost, but to initiate the defrost based on coil temperature. Okay, now if you don't have frost on the coil and you force the defrost, it's not going to stay in defrost very long. But if you have a frosted up coil, this is a great way that you can go through and force a defrost on the unit to see if the unit can successfully defrost, if we're facing a charge issue, or if you have to manually defrost, this can certainly be something to try to help you get in the right direction of relieving that ice off of the outdoor coil. So getting into the actual air codes or the most common air codes that we see um, on our indoor units. Now, if, it's important to notice if you look at the slide where it says indoor air code display and it has a dash and then looking specifically at the high wall units. Each indoor unit has their own proprietary codes. However, there are a lot of codes on here that are common, such as the E1 code, which is often referred to as the communication code between that particular indoor unit and the outdoor unit. But it's very important to note, if you are troubleshooting a high wall unit, you need to make sure that you have the high wall service manual and not the outdoor unit service manual or a floor console or a ducted service manual to ensure that you are reading out the correct code and troubleshooting the correct issue. If not, you could be chasing a ghost code and chasing a problem that just simply doesn't exist because you're reading out of the wrong service manual and referencing the wrong code. Now on this one, you'll see I have three ones highlighted on here. These would be the most common ones that we run into on the high wall style units. The first one that's highlighted on there is going to be your E1 code, which is the communication between your indoor and your outdoor unit. This is most common typically among the single zone and the multi-zone systems. Okay, some things to pay attention when we look at E1 codes, and we'll dive into this through later classes would be looking at the connection of wiring. Don't just assume that it's a control board. Work the codes. You have to look at the wiring. You have to know the voltages that we need to check and what ranges are acceptable between our neutral, our L2 and N, and our signal wires. That's where we're going to take a DC voltage ring. And again, we'll get into the nitty gritty of how to troubleshoot that code in later tech tips. But understand that is our communication code on the 40 MAQ high wall unit. Our next one's going to be E3, which is our indoor fan speed that has been out of control. Now, what that means in layman's terms is that there's something that's preventing that indoor fan motor from running, whether it's something physically stuck in the blades and it's causing it to amp out and trip off on this code, or if we have a fan motor that's disconnected from the main board, or if the motor's starting to fail, if one of the windings is getting weak, it tries to start up, it overamps, and it kicks off on this E3 code. Just some of the things that can cause that. And then finally, we have an FO code, which is an overload current protection. Okay, it's important to note on this, this FO code or this overload current protection typically is associated with something that occurs in the outdoor unit. It's always important to double check your indoor unit, your wiring connections, ohm out fan motors on your indoor unit. But typically speaking, this is a focus that you want to start looking at the outdoor unit first. Okay, but this is a current protection error. 
But these would be three of the most common ones that we have on our high wall sound units. Now, the nice part with the cassette, the ducted, and the floor console models is that they all share the same nomenclature for display error codes across their models. So in reality, when you're looking at error codes, you need to make sure that if you have a high wall unit, you're looking at that particular service name. For the cassette ducted and floor console units, their error codes mean the exact same thing. So you could have a cassette unit looking at a ducted unit service manual and the error code is going to be the correct error code that you're referencing out of the ducted manual for a cassette unit. So it's just important to know which ones we, uh, we share and then which ones are different. So you'll see on here, the one I have highlighted is going to be an F8, which is a lifting panel malfunction. So what that means is, is that if you play around with that louver motor and you end up jerking it out of its factory position or the home position and you go to try to turn the system on or you do it while the system's on currently and you get this F8, the way to resolve that is, is to shut the system off, wait 30 seconds. When you shut the system off, the natural position for it is to go back to its home position and the louver should close automatically and seal up. Wait 30 seconds, turn the system back on and that F8 code should be taken care of and should no longer be present in the system. Okay, Again, that's on your cassette, ducted, and floor console models. Now, however, the ducted don't have louvers, only the floor consoles and the cassettes do, so that will be a code applicable to a cassette or a floor console style unit. Now, looking at the multi-zone error codes, this is where it's extremely important to know not only where are you reading the code, but what service manual you're reading the code from. Now, if you look at the indoor service manual, we know that the E1 from two slides ago was a communication care error. But if you use that same E1 on an outdoor unit, you'll notice that the outdoor unit doesn't display an E1. It displays an E2. So it's always important to have the correct service manuals and also know where you're reading the code. Because if you're reading a code off a wired controller, but you're using an indoor unit service manual code chart, you're going to be referencing the wrong code. Like I stated before, you're going to chase a ghost problem and never really get to the bottom of what's going on with that unit. I want to have highlighted on here is a P6 code. P6 on the cassette, floor console, and ducted units on there actually relates to a low pressure situation. If you see a P6 on a multi-zone system on a 40 MAQ high wall unit or a 40 MPH high wall unit or a 40 MHH high wall unit, that P6 is not listed in the service manual. And essentially what that's telling you is to go to the outdoor unit to tr troubleshoot the code at the outdoor unit. Typically the codes that we have associated with the P6 are a P1, which is high pressure protection or P2 which is low pressure protection. Of course, whatever code you have is going to determine how you're going to troubleshoot that system. But a good rule of thumb is if you go in the high wall unit service manual, it stops at P4. So if you see a P6 on a high wall style unit, whether it's on a single or a multi-zone system, that is essentially telling you to go to the outdoor unit and troubleshoot the code at the outdoor unit. One other thing to note with the 40 MAQ high walls and something that is not listed in the service manual on these specific units. If you have a call or you run across a unit that you see two dashes on the display of that high wall unit, that indicates that the current unit is in a mode conflict, which means one is calling for heat, one is calling for cooling. Now, by default from the factory, these systems are set up as a heating priority which means if you have a call for cooling or five calls for cooling and one call for heat, the system will run heat. The best way to know which system is calling for cooling and which system is calling for heating is to look at the dash dashes. The unit that has the dash dash is the unit that is trying to call for the opposing mode. Now, in this case, if we had a system calling for heat and a system calling for cooling, the system calling for cooling would have the dash dash. And that stems back to the fact that that outdoor unit is a heating priority configuration from the factory and it's going to satisfy the call for heat. Now, an important thing to know on here is that it does not automatically switch over. So a lot of guys think, well, that's not a big deal because if I have a call for heat, once that heat call is done, it'll switch over and then run the call for cooling. And unfortunately, that's just not how the configuration of those mode swapping works or this mode conflict works. The systems have to be both in heat 
or both in cooling. It will not switch over if it's in a mode conflict after the heating call is satisfied. That's why we always tell everybody it's either all heat or all cooling. We do not recommend the use of auto mode in a multi-zone system. Okay, but the dash dash indicates a mode conflict. To resolve this issue, all you need to do is take your wireless controller or your wired wall controller and change that mode to heat. You should see that dash dash go away and then the set point should come back up and the louver motor should open. Okay, the other thing that I want to mention with the 40 MAQ high wall units is their unique function to be able to display thermistor temperatures for the particular indoor unit that you're dealing with. Okay, so that'll be your T1 and T2 thermistor temperatures, which is your return air, which is T1, and your indoor coil temperature sensor, which is T2. It can also give you the outdoor air, the condenser coil or outdoor coil temperature, and then also the compressor discharge protection temperature as well. All that information you can get off of your high wall unit without taking the unit apart. And this is done by using the RG57 wireless remote controller or the wireless remote controller that has a white body with that little orange yellowish on and off button. That is the only wireless controller that has that capability to date to be able to get into the sub menu on here and to use for troubleshooting purposes. Now, unfortunately, the cassette ducted and floor console style units do not have the availability to do this just because they don't have a digital screen. There are larger tonnage units that have a digital screen, but they will not read out a thermistor reading like the 40 MAQs, the 40 MHHs, and the 40 MPHs do. So all of our low, mid, and high tier series, high wall units, do offer this capability to look at the return air, the coil temperature, and then also the thermistors at the outdoor unit. And there's a bunch of great other detail um, that you can check out in the advanced service tech tip that I put a class together for that goes really into depth on what you can access by getting into this menu on there. But just as a brief overview, in order to get into this menu, you do not need to cycle power. All you need to do is to press your LED button on your wireless controller three times, followed by pressing the swing feature on your wireless controller. After you have pressed the LED three times, you'll press the swing three times. After you hit both of those three time configurations between the LED and the swing, You'll hear a second pause and then an elongated beep, followed by what looks like an R1 that comes up on your indoor unit. Now, the way that that digital display reads out, it looks like an R1. It is actually T1. That's your return air temperature sensor. Once you're in that menu, you can hit your LED button on the, on the wireless controller to navigate through. You'll see an R2, which is T2. Then you hit the LED button again. You'll see R3, which is T3, so on and so forth. There also is a menu that you can hit on there to navigate to get different information depending on whether you're doing maintenance or you're trying to troubleshoot. One important thing you want to note on here as well, all the temperature readouts for these sensors come back and display as Celsius reading. So if you click on T1, you'll see it come up as 25 degrees. That is not 25 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 25 degrees Celsius. Please make sure that you convert that over to get an accurate temperature reading. And of course, with any thermistor, Plus or minus two degrees is the rule for those to be reading correctly. Anything outside of that range, I would suggest replacing the thermistor that you're trying to work on or trying to troubleshoot. So that concludes today's tech tip. Just something real basic, especially for the greener guys that are getting into ductless split systems that really haven't done a whole lot of troubleshooting on these systems before. These are great points that you can start and understand where to read codes how to approach and troubleshoot a wireless remote controller or an infrared receiver board, and also understanding some of the little hiccups that we run into that aren't necessarily documented in the service manual to help you troubleshoot that system more effectively and to be able to get a better resolution time for your customer. Of course, if you have any questions on anything that we've covered today, you can always reach out to me via phone. My direct extension you can see on the screen is 129. Or if you feel more comfortable, shoot me an email about something that I covered or something that you would like to see in future tech tips, please feel free to shoot me an email. And then again, if you need to get a hold of a product manager, both of which are listed for the ductless in the VRF product line. And then of course, if I'm not available, the other three gentlemen in our technical service department will be more than happy to assist you with any of your VRF or ductless needs. So again, I thank you guys for attending this tech tips. Look forward to seeing you on the next one and stay safe out there.